Our next presenter is someone, um, this is a, a great pleasure for me to introduce because I've known Dr. Holly Cheever for many, many years. And the one thing I can say about Holly is that she never wavers. She, you know what side she's on. It's on, always on the side for the animals. She doesn't have this strange code that some veterinarians have about being afraid to really speak their mind. That's not Holly. Holly, what you see is what you get. Uh, she's an award-winning veterinarian, large and small. She's been a columnist, um, a lecturer. Um, she's on the board of the New York State Humane Association. Um, she's involved with veterinarians for equine welfare. And anything, when you need Holly, she, I, I've seen her, you know, we've done cruelty cases where we've picked up animals. She's always there. Um, Holly is one of the great people of the world, and I don't often say that. And it's my pleasure to welcome Holly Cheever. Well, I have a couple of full disclosures to say, and the first one is that it is definitely a sign of the love for which I feel for you, my dear, and the admiration and respect, because this is not a topic that I wanted to talk about. It's about irritating people doing aggravating things. <laughs> and, um, and I think most of you know why these irritating people do the things they do, but anyway, I will codify it for you, since I won't be mentioning any names, even though it's on tape, I don't think I can get sued for slander. Sued for slander. Um, I also did not have time to do anything kind of PowerPoint-wise, which I don't think is essential, besides which, what would I do? I'd have pictures of dried-up old white men. So, you know, <laughs> you, don't, you, you don't need those. So instead, please look at my beautiful rescued Montana the banana quarter horse. And Montana, I'll share a little bit about Montana. He actually never was treated cruelly. He just was treated in a fashion that would bore most horses, in that he was used as a lesson horse for... You know how it is with little girls. At 13, they fall in love with horses. Daddy buys them a horse because they don't want them to start thinking about drugs, sex, and rock and roll. So they love the horse until they're 18, and then they discover drugs, sex, and rock and roll. <laughs> and so they go on, and poor Montana would get sold to the next 13-year-old. And the only people, so Montana's been with me for about 15 years, the only people he really does not like are girls from 13 to 18. <laughs> and, and I'm sure they all treated him well because he's adorable. But um, I think he just had enough already. <laughs> so once you're kind of, you know, into the 20s, then he thinks you're a wonderful human again. And he is just a very endearing person. Anyway, um, as Susan and I were trying to think about what we would entitle this, um, it came out with what you see there, professional equine interest groups, their position supporting horse slaughter, and why? And my own subtitle would be, so what's wrong with these people? <laughs> and the other subtitle, I would love to have John Holland's, um, that slide you showed with that horse doing that kind of horse slop with WTF, which most of us know what that means, and if not, ask your neighbor. <laughs> but at any rate, my challenge is to try to explain the inexplicable. And I don't know that I'm better than that than anyone else, but I can ex sort of explain where the roots of their outlooks come from, and then we can all sort of figure out what we can do about it. Now, I was born in 1950, so you can all do the math, but what that means is that I was a rapid anti-war activist in the late 60s and early 70s. And because of that, with a group of about 180 people of all walks of life in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I used to do passive demonstration sit-ins. We'd shut down the Boston Army base when they were having a draft day or a Newton draft board or a Somerville draft board or whatever, get arrested, get fingerprinted, all these lovely things. But back then, when we were dealing with the anti-war movement and the um, civil rights movement, there was a sort of a common mantra that was, if you're not a part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. And those of you who are old enough to remember that, I'm sure that will resonate with you. And so what we're going to be looking at here is the professional stakeholders in equine medicine, equine philosophies, equine care. You know, are the professional stakeholders part of the problem or are they part of the solution? And I think we've um, gone through enough presentations here this session and with the previous three to all have strong feelings about that. We're going to start off talking about the medical groups, and that would be the AVMA, American Veterinary Medical Association, which is the mothership. And we'll spend most of our time on that particular organization because the state groups below that, like the New York State Vet Medical Society or the Oregon Vet Medical Society, are very much in lockstep with the AVMA and uh, follow its leads. And similarly, that is also true of the professional um, interest groups like the AAEP, American Association of Equine Practitioners, uh, 
American Academy of Feline Practitioners, all of the different, as I say, interest groups also very much follow the ABMA's lead. Um, and the AAEP, of course, the equine practitioners, sort of have that extra cowboy kind of flair that goes along with it because of many of their members being a sort of that persuasion. persuasion. And then I'm also going to mention very briefly as being part of the solution, uh, two groups, Veterinarians for Equine Welfare, founded by the wonderful Dr. Nick Dodman, who has worked, I think, ardently on Canadian issues. And uh, John mentioned his article um, in your presentation that had to do with the tainted meat issue. Um, and also with the Humane Society Veterinary Medical Association, of which I was a founding uh, member, um, because we are, frankly, on the right side of the issues. I'll also just briefly mention American Farriers Association, the veterinary colleges, and a little bit about the breeders. But again, we're going to be mostly focusing on the professional groups, like the, the medical groups. So back to the mothership. Um, as I said, the AVMA uh, was itself founded um, somewhere in, I guess, actually, the profession of veterinary medicine recognized as such in America started in 1863. But it was basically as horse doctors. Those are the only species, the only species that was considered to be of interest or of uh, any relevance for the attention of, of the doctors. And in fact, there's, uh, since I went to the Cornell Veterinary School, there's a very famous quote to Cornellians um, uttered by uh, Andrew White, who was the founder of Cornell, bellowing out to the first college president, Ezra Cornell, in 1868 as Cornell was boarding on a ship to go back to England and Europe to pick up some faculty to, to get the Cornell University off the ground. And uh, the founder, Andrew White, is allegedly have been heard to say, cupping his hands and bellowing across the water of New York's harbor, don't forget the horse doctor, which to him was one of the most important people to bring back from Europe. And he brought back James Law, a Scotsman, a brilliant veterinarian who became the Cornell Vet School's first founding member or teacher. But back then, so remember, he didn't say, please bring back the animal doctor. He said the horse doctor, and that's important. Um, so horses, remember, though, back then, what did horses do for the country and for people, the whole species? They were labor and they were transportation, and they were the machines of war. You know, until I think it was at World War I with the poor horses, they still were using a cavalry, and the horses got blown away by submachine gun fire. Awful to think about. But at any rate, so horses were not the fuzzy pets. They were not like my Montana. Um, they were very much utilitarian. And so basically, veterinary medicine sort of evolved over the next few decades. And for those of you who go to the, your vet with your dogs and cats, you may not realize it, but they were very much latecomers to the whole focus of veterinary medicine. First of all, it was horses, as I said. And then the next focus uh, was basically food and fiber animals, you know, the swine and the poultry and the beef and the dairy cattle. Um, and then finally, uh, the dog distemper vaccine was developed in the 20s. And dogs became sort of of interest between 20s and 30s. Kitties didn't join the focus until about the 50s, um, so they were very late comers. And many people who work with uh, urban or municipal legislation about cats realize how far down on the pecking order they are when you're trying to talk about licensing cats so that they get the same respect that dogs do. But again, that first linkage with the ABMA and with veterinary medicine with production medicine and horses as production elements um, created this long-lasting linkage, which is ongoing till the present. And it doesn't matter that the uh, pr uh, membership of the AVMA has changed, because the AVMA is now roughly 70% small animal practitioners with very different um, beliefs and, and precepts, but they are not the ones who get to make the decisions. And I'm going to be talking from here on in basically about agribusiness. And agribusiness, you just might as well put Farm Bureau right in there, because that's what agribusiness basically is, what Farm Bureau is, is representing and how they vote, therefore. The other major linkage that the veterinary profession has had over all these years is with pharmaceutical industries. And that has a huge impact on how we feed our animals and what we permit the, to them to be drugged with. Um, and so as the veterinary field and agricultural fields and agribusiness and pharmaceutical companies were all kind of developing at the same time, they all became powerful about the same time. They all became wealthy at about the same time. And again, this ongoing linkage has persisted right up to the present day. So um, agribusiness has huge alliances with organized veterinary medicine. There's uh, mutual financial support. Uh, forms of huge sums of money spent for the AVMA conventions. If you go to the conventions, they're all underwritten by 
production companies or by pharmaceutical industry companies. Um, they also underwrite educational programs, and it's going to come as a shock to you, I know, but that does tend to bias the educational programs a little bit. Uh, they do grants for vet research. They do uh, advertising for the AVMA. So the AVMA basically owes them a whole lot and is not about to do anything to jeopardize that relationship with either agribusiness or with the pharmaceutical industry. So uh, if you're ever doing anything legislative, like, for instance, on the federal level with horse issues, uh, if you ever do anything on a state uh, basis, you are going to have the absolute opposition for, from a welfare standpoint coming from the veterinarians as they exert pressure for all kinds of pharmaceutical or agribusiness interests that may impact those particular uh, you know, fields of endeavor. So they will protect feed, crop, meat, milk, egg production against all adversaries, including even their own members, including anything having to do with environmental protection and certainly against any kind of animal welfare issues. Um, and even this is even the case when there is all sorts of research that challenges and even humiliates the AVMA as to their current stances. Now, there are two things I really think you need to absolutely understand about both the AVMA and the New York State Vet Societies or Massachusetts or whatever state you come from. The first of all is that they do not pull their membership ever. Let me back up. They do not pull their membership ever. So when they come and make a pronouncement about a policy statement, it's not for the AVMA checking with all 80,000 members. It is not in the New York State Society checking with any of us. The executive board decides what's what, what's going to piss off pharmaceuticals and agribusiness companies the least, and that's what forms their decisions and their policies. And in fact, um, Chris Hyde of the Animal Welfare Institute mentioned once that, um, I guess this is back in 2004 and 2005, they did a membership poll of the AVMA somehow, and you sure can't get that information now, somehow they got the um, addresses of all AVMA members, and they sent out a poll to all AVMA members on horse slaughter. Do you su support or do you oppose it? And of course the membership back saying, it sucks. Uh, only in more professional language. Um, but at any rate, at about two seconds later, the AVMA came out with a policy stating, uh, it's our policy that no one's allowed to do membership polls ever, ever, ever. So you can't do those polls anymore. They somehow deny access to anybody for their addresses of, of members. So, And I've had my own experience with the AVMA in, in that kind of line. Um, between 1993 and 2005, I annually went to the AVMA representing the Association of Veterinarians for Animal Rights, and believe me, the AVMA and AVAR, we were like this. <laughs> anyway, and it was on things that would be to most of us kind of no-brainers, like let's not crop and dock dogs' tails and ears anymore, uh, let's not do foie gras. Does anybody know, does anybody here not know what foie gras is? Well, foie gras is a four-week process in which you take, in this country, ducks. You jam a metal pipe down their throat three times a day. Metal, mind you, not, not a gentle gavage pipe like you might do to resuscitate injured wildlife. Um, and you pour a very liver-damaging but fatty deposition-promoting um, feed into them three times a day. And meanwhile, as this goes on for four weeks, they develop hepatic lipidosis. Their livers swell to 10 to 12 times normal size. They can't walk. They're having epileptic seizures because their liver has died. And when you eat the foie gras, it is basically diseased liver from diseased birds spread on toast. So avoid it at your next, uh, you know, cocktail party. But at any rate, um, so I had been um, lobbying about, you know, we thought this would be so simple. How could anyone? It's a diseased effing liver, for God's sakes, and you're putting it in your mouth. I'd rather eat out of a cat box than eat foie gras. <laughs> but it, it, <laughs> true, true. But at any rate, so year after year, I would go knock on the door. And I, I clean up nice, and I'd be very Bostonian, which is where I'm from, and very polite and very cogent and very articulate, and I would not let them flap me. But I'd show these horrendous images about what you were doing and with this production. And so one year, I, they were tired of the same old images, so I'd gotten a whole new set of undercover um, investigators' images, and I began to pass them out, and they said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that because we just passed a rule... Uh, yeah, we, we, we just passed, well, that you can't bring in new pictures um, uh, uh, when you're going to talk to us. And I went, oh, that sounds like it's been really hard-lined, codified, and I'm sure in the books already, uh, you know, standing. So in other words, the AVMA will always change the rules to suit their convenience to protect themselves as they get into increasingly um, out of the mainstream decisions and policies, unfortunately. Um, 
And as we talked yesterday, they always, their final recourse is always the whole science-based business. And I don't remember which, was that you that was mentioning about science-based? So science-based, when it is clearly, absolutely clear that something is heinous, and a four-year-old child would be able to tell you that it's heinous, they fall back on the science-based evidence indicates that it's not a problem. And so, you know, you will look at the sows, if you see some of the very dreary footage of chickens in battery cages, and the chickens are packed in like cordwood. They cannot even stretch their wings. Or if you look at gestation crate sows, and they're all doing stereotypic behavior, which by the Animal Welfare Act on the federal level, anything that creates stereotypic behavior is shows absolutely conclusively that the management system is abusive. That's even on the federal level. But of course, oh, it doesn't apply to farm animals. I forgot, I forgot. At any rate, so you look at the sow biting the bars and, and, and doing all this, you know, pacing back and forth and the glassy eyes. But because science-based evidence does not show that their cortisol levels have risen up high, well, therefore, they're not stressed. But again, if you talk with endocrinologists, there are 847 reasons why they may not have high adrenaline levels at the time you sample them. And at some point, one should be able to say, science-based, okay, fine, but what about the fact that this animal is clearly suffering and in pain? Um, so uh, that's one thing is New York State is the same thing, the New York State Vet Society right now um, and the legislature. It, it, same thing in terms of never polling their members. The executive board comes down with a pronouncement, and that's what it's going to be, and it does not matter what their members feel. So currently, before the New York State legislature, there is a law to ban decline on cats. High time. You know, that's 10 amputations, by the way, 10 amputa opportunities for phantom pain, such as humans experience with amputations, and creates more behavior problems than it solves. Uh, and so the New York State Vet Society rapidly opposes that and is calling all the legislatures. And when I call as a member of the New York State Humane Association or Humane Society Veterinary Medical Association, they say, yeah, we know you're a vet. Okay, so we, we know you really opposed this bill. I go, no, no, no. We're supporting this bill. And he goes, oh, well, we're getting dozens of calls from the New York State Vet Society saying not to let it out. So. Again, did they poll their members? No. And uh, the 70% of the New York State Society or the ABMA who are small animal practitioners and don't approve of some of these practices, we are just not given a voice at all. Another essential AVMA and state society characteristic is they really don't want to be told what to do. They're somewhat of control freaks. Now, I'm a control freak, quite frankly. I just am packaged small so people don't notice it for a while. <laughs> but um, still, uh, so I can kind of understand why I would be offended if someone told me to do something that would be more injurious. But in fact, um, they are upholding their right to make all decisions, and that is why they also fight, in addition to fighting the declaw ban, they're also fighting in half for years the devocalization ban. Are you guys familiar with devocalization? So dogs, it's, it happens to cats too, if you have Siamese cats breeders or something, or but people who are dog breeders, um, you know, they've got too many dogs, they're not very happy, they're left alone all day, so they start to bark a lot. Instead of solving the behavioral reason why they're barking, you know, get them companionship, get them to doggy daycare, do something to help them out, they devocalize them by pulling out their larynxes, their vocal folds, and the only drawback to that is then they tend to have all this like tacky inhalation pneumonia and they can have problems with heat stress and scarring where they can't breathe anymore. So it's horrendously cruel and the AVMA is way on board with that as the New York State Society is too because by gum, we're going to save a dog going off to be euthanized if we don't have the right to do this procedure. And again, euthanasia is not the solution. There are certainly other solutions that are humane. So the other thing that's a little bit awkward for the AVMA with their lockstep of um, adherence to uh, both um, pharmaceutical industry and agribusiness is that it leads to some really tacky kind of scientific uh, inconsistencies. So for example, number one, um, one of the first things we learn in vet school is that uh, you cannot give dogs or cats or any animal sub-therapeutic levels of antibiotics because it is the textbook way to create resistant bacteria. Which is, by the way, for all of you out there who don't follow your veterinarian's advice when they say, please give this pill for 10 days, and you come in next year and you say, well, I still have about seven days worth of that drug left from last time. We have a reason why we ask you to do it 10 days. So just, just, just give us a little, throw us a bone here and just do what we say. Um, because in fact, if you under-treat an animal with a drug, then what you do is you weed out the susceptible bacteria, but you, therefore, the only bacteria left to thrive and breed are the ones that can overcome that drug. So if you're creating a um, 
drug resistance issues, remember that particularly when you are feeding it to farmed animals, and then someone gets a disease, a foodborne illness from eating a farmed animal, and then you're trying the drug that was actually in the feed but created the resistant bacteria that now is affecting the human who's going to die from it because there's no drugs around, well, you've got a problem there because and you have created it. And for those of you who are not familiar with food animal production, any CAFOs, which is, stands for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation, which is factory farming, jamming all these animals together, to the ruination of the environment and all of that, they are all on sub-therapeutic feed additives of antibiotics. Now, the pharmaceutical companies like that, because why? They get more money. The drugs that we feed to everybody, every mammal, every individual on the face of the earth, more of it is going into animal feeds and is going to feed um, or be used therapeutically to treat human or veterinary patient illnesses. So, well, the pharmaceutical industry is thrilled to have the AVMA support subtherapeutic drug additions to the, to the diet. The producer is thrilled because these wretched housing situations, which are lethal, can be lethal to the animal trying to survive in them, they'll have a little bit of a better edge, a little bit of better um, crop the end of a production cycle if they've used these subtherapeutic levels. So the producers are thrilled with it because they're going to get more profit from having more animals survive. But it's a terrible, terrible thing to do scientifically. So the American Medical Association gets up every year or so and goes essentially only more professionally, ay -yi 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 you know, what is wrong with the AVMA? Why are they, they know this is ridiculous, why the hell are they doing it? The CDC, Center for Disease Control, NIH, public health organizations all around the state, all around the country are horrified by the AVMA's adherence to using these subtherapeutic drug levels. But they're not going to change because they get money from it. They get kickbacks from the agricultural business, uh, you know, motherships themselves, as well as from the pharmaceutical injury, I industries. And the other medical inconsistency, which drives me somewhat crazy, is the whole thing about the tainted meat, you know, the horse meat that is so tainted with all these 180 drugs that they've discovered in them, and particularly phenylbutazone. Um, when I was first out of veterinary school, I was a dairy veterinarian for about three years. And I loved it in a sense because it was just before, again, remember how old I am, it was just before um, in Cortland County, which is the middle of the state, just before it had gone from the small family farm to the major, you know, 1,000, 2,000 cow dairies we now have in New York State. And so the cows still had names, and they still went out every day, and I probably have 50 different heifers named Holly after me when I, you know, delivered them, and they turned out to be girls. Of course, they all now have long since gone into McDonald's burgers and, and you know, the, the tragedy of all of that. But at any rate, as a dairy veterinarian, I had to carry a liability insurance policy worth $3 million dollars because if I forgot the withdrawal time in treating a cow with mastitis, mastitis, of course, is an infection of the udder, very common in the sloppy, dirty dairy environment. And if I told the farmer, okay, here's three tubes of a, you know, infusion to put in that, that teat and, and to, you know, treat that udder, you can do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but after Wednesday, you make sure if she doesn't do well, you can't ship her for slaughter for at least a week after because this is a drug named X and its withdrawal time is Y. And we were very, very strict about adhering to those withdrawal times so you don't get drugs into the milk, which then goes into a bulk tank, which then in parts per million, and then if I cause the death of some human with that drug re uh, ad uh, reactivity or allergy, hence the $3 million uh, of uh, insurance I had to carry. And by the way, for small animal practice, I get by fine with $100,000 worth of insurance coverage. But at any rate, so here the AVMA was pounding it into our heads about drug withdrawal times and being so careful about not tainting the meat or the, or the milk or the eggs or whatever, and yet they really are not leaping up to the plate, are they, when it comes to the whole thing about the horse meat being tainted. Um, one other thing about the AVMA, uh, when you think about the companion animal type of the field, which is 70% of veterinary medicine in this country versus the production medicine or, or, or uh, industrial or, or um, research or whatever, uh, the, they have something called the anim laughingly called the Animal Welfare Committee. And the Animal Welfare Committee started in the late 80s, and by the time we got to 1995, there were 14 members representing all of veterinary medicine in this, in this country and 14 members of which only four of them represented small animal medicine or companion animal medicine. The rest were all pharmacy, lab animal medicine, industry, 
swine, poultry, you know, everything having to do with production, whereas the four, one of them was someone who could be a companion animal vet, one represented the American Animal Hospital Association, which is kind of the, the state of the art, higher quality practices, typically small animal. One member represented humane or welfare societies, and one represented pet bird medicine, but the rest were all industry, hardly reflecting the uh, composition of the uh, organization. Now, when you go to 2015, that was 1995 when I was allowed to sit in as a guest, but not really allowed to talk. Um, <laughs> and 2015, there now are 18 members, only five of whom are representative of uh, the 70 percent of our of our practice. They added feline practitioners to that, but the rest, they also added three more industry roles, too. So, um, as I mentioned, I lobbied the ABMA for about a dozen years on various things, including shutting down foie gras, or at least, you know, take a stand against it so we can make it illegal in various states by saying the AVMA disapproves of this cruelty. Wouldn't do that. Uh, wouldn't do air crops and tail docks for years until finally they got another friendlier, less intimidating group to take it on. But, you know, the th reason that we had started trying to get the AVMA to take a stand against tail docks was in 1993, the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons God bless them. I sure wish I was a British vet because they're so much easier to get along with. They actually forced through Parliament a bill that made it illegal to tail dock dogs. And in my naivete, I called them shortly thereafter because we decided at AVAR, Veterinarians for Animal Rights, that we would do the same thing. We couldn't make anything legislative, but it could at least get the AVMA to take a stand against that kind of worthless and cruel. You are severing off the bottom of the spinal column of an animal. It should give someone some discomfort in there to think about it. So I called the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons to find out, so how did you guys do this? And then I said, and he basically said, well, we actually had no choice because our, our technicians who hold the puppies for the tail dock when they knew there was a litter coming in to be docked, they would all leave the building and refuse to hold the puppies because they knew it was wrong. So we said, okay, then we'll pass it, push it through Parliament, and they did. Uh, but I said, so how come you didn't do something about ear cropping? And I wish I could do a Downton Abbey accent for you, but I can't and I won't try. But there was this like, kind of like a <sighs> sigh at the other end of the transatlantic line. And he said, well, we've known better than to do something so stupid and atrocious for over a century. And if you know better than to do something, you don't need to legislate against it now, do you? I went, <laughs> OK, thank you. Quick. Anyway, so we tried for years to get the ABMA to take a watered down little itty bitty stance that it's not such a good effing idea. And only they finally would agree, as long as not AVAR, Veterinarians for Animal Rights, but another um, group took it on so they didn't have to confess to jumping into bed with the scary leftist people. Um, they finally came out with a statement that basically says, so tail docking's not so great, but if you'll pay me, I'll do it. Uh -huh. Oh, that's great, okay. Anyway, so again, you know, the AVMA and I are not totally on the same plane. And I think I also did swine gestation efforts and forced molting, forced molting. Who knows what forced molting is? Oh, my children, let me enlighten you. Forced molting is a practice that happens in the egg-laying industry. And if you have your chickens laying eggs for their first laying cycle, and you want to get one more year out of them, well, by, by gum, the best way to do that is to starve the birds for two whole weeks. And the survivors will have an enhanced laying cycle the next time around if they survive it. Now, call me picky, but it's actually illegal in every state in the country to starve your agricultural animals for two weeks. It's illegal. But at any rate, the AVMA would not take a stand against that for years and years and years until finally the Association of Avian Pathologists realized that they were looking bad on this, and they took it up, and then they finally agreed to say that it was wrong after the United Egg Producers had already said it was wrong, so they don't get any credit there. But finally, you know, I was, guess was looking so pathetic and appealing when there, nothing worked year after year after year. People would come up to me and say, you know, Holly, you got it wrong. You need to go to the humane societies about these things because we are not about animal welfare. We're about veterinary welfare. We're about veterinary welfare and specifically veterinary business welfare. Talk about candid, you know, well, and I don't think I was terribly shocked by that point, but what a hell of a quote, because that's not the way the American public thinks that the AVMA must be. Veterinarians, for some reason, have an enormous high reputation in this country, and people will say they'd rather, you know, give kudos to their veterinarian than their doctor, their this or that, the other, because they assume that we all must be animal lovers or we wouldn't be in that field. But at any rate, so don't let me have the scales fall from your eyes, but it's not all about animal love. Um, and they have euthanasia guidelines. Euthanasia guidelines used to be revised about every 15 years, but in the last 20 years they've gotten revised about every five because there's more and more challenge to what used to be considered acceptable methods of euthanasia. And sometimes these revisions are better and sometimes they're worse. 
And the AVMA tends to, when it comes to food animal production, um, slaughter or euthanasia. Of course, you can't really call slaughter euthanasia. You probably all know, but euthanasia is Greek for a good death. That's you is good, thanasia is death. And slaughter ain't a good death or a humane death by anyone's, guy, um, you know, anyone's imagination. But many of you may be familiar with the name Temple Grandin. Anyone heard of Temple Grandin? So Temple Grandin and I are not quite like this. Um, she is, uh, I mean, to give her credit where credit is due, she's a highly functional autistic person who's, f um, why do you snigger, young lady? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving on. There was a HBO special, a movie made out, uh, made of hers several years ago about with Claire Danes in the title role. And um, she's an interesting human uh, to talk to or listen to and uh, always wears the, um, what do you call them, the yoke cowboy shirts and the boots and all of that. And to her credit, she is trying to make slaughter a little less scary for the last five minutes of an animal's life while it goes up knowing, smelling death, smelling fear pheromones, and knowing that awful things are going to happen. But at least she tries to make that last walk a little less scary. So um, Temple Grandin is, like I say, this kind of icon or folk hero in the agribusiness industry because people can point to a slaughter plant and say, well, they're using Temple Grandin's guidelines, so that means that it's a very humane and, and a nice place for your animals to be killed. And AVMA uses her, just is thrilled to have her as sort of their spokesperson, their mouthpiece for their way they develop their uh, euthanasia or slaughter guidelines. And I have a personal reason why I'm not so fond of her. Um, one of the th unfortunate hats I wear is that I'm very articulate and good at writing. So I get groups like PETA, HSUS, Mercy for Animals, Compassion Over Killing, all these groups that send me horrendous undercover videos for me to an analyze as to why they are cruel, why this promotes suffering, why this violates the state's anti-cruelty laws. These are not great bedtime movies. And when my husband hears the noises in the background, he says, turn that off or close the door, because he can see in his mind's eye what I'm looking at. But at any rate, so I had done an evaluation of a slaughter plant in, I don't remember what state, years ago, where in fact, as so often happens, the cattle were, um, I don't know if you know what exactly what happens in a slaughter plant, but the animal is driven into a kill box, stunned supposedly the first time with a, usually the captive bolt. And if you place it right, you may be stunned correctly the first time or not. But anyway, um, the animal then has its hind leg shackled with a chain, elevated while still unconscious, and then the vessels coming out of the thoracic inlet, the great veins coming out, are slit, and you hope that the animal is unconscious while it is ebbing, its life blood just ebbs away. And I had a terrible experience um, going to slaughterhouses as going to a future dairy vet at Cornell, went to an East Syracuse plant. And if I hadn't been a vegetarian for years, that certainly would have pushed me over the edge because you know those animals know they're going to die. And unfortunately, I was there at one point where one cow is hoisted up, so she's dangling with her 1,400 pounds hanging from her left hip joint. And the guy who's supposed to be slitting her vessels had gone off to have a cigarette break, so she came conscious, and she's twisting and flailing. Anyway, I won't, I won't force you to understand that but, or, or think about that, but... Um, it's just not humane. But at any rate, um, temp so the point being that Temple Grandin was at a conference and talking about how some stupid poodle practitioner from New York State had written that this was this you know that there was this was not a humane way to die. Clearly referencing me, I would not call myself a poodle practitioner, but never mind. <laughs> and uh, I do like poodles, but I'm just that's just that that's not the sum of Holly Cheever. But at any rate, she was a little bit scathing, so I came up to her afterwards and said, excuse me, I am that poodle practitioner, but I also do cows. And you go goddamn well that you saw on that video that we all looked at, you did see a, a live animal responding to stimuli, which they tend not to do when they're dead. So, in fact, that was live. So she backed down quietly, but ha, ha, ha. But uh, at any rate, like I say, she and I are not like this. So anyway, after looking at uh, horse slaughter, um, Temple came out with some humane guidelines as to why horse slaughter could be done humanely, and therefore, um, you know, under co certain conditions, this could be a, a humane way to dispatch horses. So she does things which I would agree with. Number one, video monitoring over the internet by a third party. Okay, I'm all about auditing. That would be just fine. And then she has a whole bunch of precepts which, as they stand, are fine, but they're never going to happen. All the whole thing about a slaughter line is that you have been given by your boss, by the shift boss, you've got to do one animal per 49 seconds. And that's why half of them are still conscious when they're being slid and, and dismembered. 
Anyway, so she said we want a non, for horses, it's specifically about horses, a non-slip floor in the stunning box, because horses panic, of course, if their footing is bad and they're scared anyway. Uh, a level floor, well, that would be nice. Horses don't do well slipping on slippery floors that are sloped. Um, solid sides so that the horse can't see the activity of the animals ahead of him. Okay, fine. Well-lit stunning box, because horses are scared to go into dark areas so they're unfamiliar. And what she didn't add, of course, is not only are they unfamiliar, but they reek of death and they reek of fear pheromones. Those horses know goddamn well that they're about to experience something cataclysmically terrible. Take away all the distractions, such as fans or, you know, waving curtains or anything that may um, f frighten the horse. Two people should each ha should be handling the horse, and then she talks about, um, you know, leading them instead of driving them. And she does sa say, do not use a mechanical head device to hold the horse's head, and that's sensible. So that's all wonderful. But you know when that's going to happen? Zero. It is not going to happen. The, the, they're not going to take the amount of time with that animal, and the kill box will get slippery because there's, you know, fluids all over it. So wonderful advice. Thank you, Miss Temple. <laughs> oh, excuse me, Dr. Temple. She's a PhD. But it's not going to, did that sound snotty? I didn't mean for it to. Um, but it's not going to actually physically help the horses. Um, then, so anyway, that came out there. With that as their um, sort of basis, the AVMA then could come out with their uh, slaughter and euthanasia guidelines from 2013. It is recommended that penetrating captive bolt be considered only a conditionally acceptable method for horses. Okay. But they're expecting all those conditions that Temple Grandin wrote in there to be applying, and it's not going to happen. However, we have to give them kudos for the following. It is recommended that electro electrocution be classified as unacceptable for horses. Alleluia. Good boy. Good girl. It is recommended that if gunshot remains conditionally acceptable for horses, that qualifications be made of the shooter, that they be, be both, one, trained in shooting, and two, know the proper lethal equine anatomical landmarks, so as to ensure that the first shot be fatal. Now, in Canada, you ladies would know better than I, but I believe it's all pretty much done by gunshot. Rifle shot, isn't it, more than the captive bolts? And, um, you know... And, you know, I'll talk about the Veterinarian's Fecal Equine Welfare website in a second, but you have to know exactly where to put that gun. Oh, and by the way, horses are head shy. This is why slaughter works less for horses than for any other animal species. When cattle and swine are threatened, they put their head down, cattle ready to charge, swine ready to charge, and therefore you have actually a stationary mark to try to aim at. Well, you all know horses. What does a horse do if you come at you if you come at that horse and you're strange? Exactly, head tossing, head shy animals. So there's no way they ever get a um, a good shot that is aimed where it's going to supposed to be, do some good. Now this is way too small for any of you to see, but I just wanted you to know that this is the Humane Society uh, Veterinary Medical Association's euthanasia guide. And what I think you can see, even though it's way too small, is that every species has a different anatomical mark in order to hit the brain square on, central in the cranial vault. And it's not all the same place. So you need to be trained specifically whether it's a cow or a horse or a swine or a sheep or a ram or whatever. You have to be trained as to where that bolt, that, that shot or that bolt is going to go. And that doesn't happen. Oh, but the one other thing we should be thankful for in the euthanasia guidelines. Uh, if an equine is given a neuromuscular blocking agent such as succinylcholine to better control the animal, euthanasia should then proceed as soon as control is achieved in order to avoid the chance that the horse might experience the sensation of death by suffocation. That used to be a standard way, by the way, for veterinarians to kill horses. Is succinylcholine is a paralytic agent, mm -hmm. and so what the horse experienced was that he was trying to move his diaphragm and breathe, and he suffocated to death. Might as well choke the poor thing. Ah, but wait, the AVMA says it's not a good idea. Okay, well, that's much better. I'm very happy now. Um, at any rate, uh, moving on a little bit then. So this is where they are in euthanasia. So they're trying, but I think that they're just a little bit too lax as to what is really humane and what is actually going to be accomplished. Um, and so basically, in terms of summarizing sort of the AA, uh, a, a, sorry, the AVMA in regard to their attitudes towards horses, one, you have a completely slavish adherence to agribusiness precepts and therefore an alliance with the USDA APHIS and every Farm Bureau in every state. 
And uh, some of you may know the, name of, know the name of Dr. Nina Wynand, who was at Cornell. She's retired from there. But she was a, a very a wonderful equine veterinarian and an ardent supporter of, you know, of equine activism and, and, and humane care. The way she describes it is, the AVMA has an insane commitment to animal agriculture starting in vet school. So even in vet school, you're already, if you go into any kind of production courses, you're already basically being brainwashed that Farm Bureau is king or USDA is king. So that's number one, slavish adherence to agribusiness. Number two, AVMA characteristics. Um, they um, have a lot of control exerted on them by the AVMA and pharmaceutical industries, as I mentioned earlier. Huge sums of money to support their conferences, huge grants given to them by these types of businesses to research something. And so therefore, they're not going to, to cut away from the agricultural uh, agribusiness or pharmaceutical industries is going to be a financial suicide. It's just not going to happen. Three, the executive board remains a nest of good old boys, even the women. And um, there's a phrase, chicks with dicks, which I'm afraid is not terribly um, <laughs> complimentary. But, you know, when the first woman veterinarian came on, and I, was, I had one of the few times on Naive, this, naive, this little glimmering of hope, oh, my goodness, it's a woman. Maybe things might begin to change. <laughs> Don't be silly. Um, the only reason she got to that position was that she did not rock the boat and is very much in the stranglehold of the good old boys. Um, five, uh, oh four, disregard of the actual sentiments of the 80,000 members' preferences and philosophies because they do not represent us any more than the New York State Vet Society represents me as the New York State Vet Society member when they say that we're against uh, the declaw ban. Um, five, and this I think is really key, they have a disproportionate terror of the whole slippery slope concept. And they really go out of uh, out of their way to make connections. So for instance, if I were able to get them to take a stand against ear crops, well, shit, honey, by Monday, I won't be able to have veal parmesan anymore. And it's like, no, 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 no. Just look at these all on their individual merits, and we'll take this time and time again, or piece by piece at a time. But they do not feel they can give up any kind of control. They have a stranglehold on philosophies and, and position statements. And they do not dare let in, their guard down for anything, no matter if they're entirely disparate species <coughs> and disparate um, uh, uh, subjects. So the other biggest thing, I think, is that um, they are really nervous about people analyzing equine slaughter. Because if they analyze equine slaughter, the next thing you know, they're going to be start questioning cattle slaughter and swine slaughter. And I think the biggest specter that has them waking, screaming in their middle of nightmares at night is the nation of this uh, a specter of you know these marching vegans taking over the country. And, <laughs> and in my own mind's eye, I'm thinking, you know, think of like all those um, zombie movies. And, and so, you know, like, Vegetarians coming to get them, <laughs> and if the vegetarians come to get them, then they can, you know, they are shit out of luck, and they can kiss all their funding goodbye. So I'm going to switch gears to talk a little bit about the American Association of Equine Practitioners (AAEP), and much of what I've already said about the AVMA is, you know, is, is the same thing as the AAEP, but again, they are a little bit more cowboy in orientation. And let me just express one more moment when I was uncharacteristically naive. Um, when I got out of college, it was 1971, I was burnt out by how hard I'd studied and all the anti-war activism I'd done. And I just said, I have wanted to be a vet since I was four, but I just can't bear going to school again, ever. So I went off and did things like cocktail waitressing, tree surgery, working in Appalachian, Kentucky as a home health aide, galloping racehorses uh, in the uh, Paris Pike and the Kentucky Training Center. Never a jockey, always an exercise girl. And realizing that was not quite leading me to the, the, the jobs of my dreams. So I decided that maybe I didn't want to go to vet school. And there I therefore worked for a racehorse practice in uh, Rochester, New Hampshire, for a year. And I'll omit the name. He's long since dead. But at any rate, this is where I was naive, and I can't believe it. I went up to him, and he, I got hired by this guy, and it's a racehorse practice, right? And I go up to him, and I'm thinking, gosh, you know, you must really, I'm trying to make conversation because he's kind of a not very cheery looking person. And I say, you just like really must like horses a lot because that's all you work on and that that's really cool. And he looked at me and said, horses? Fuck horses. That's where the money is. And I'm going, oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, the nice thing about that practitioner was that he was my negative inspiration to go to vet school because he used to kill horses for insurance money that came for surgery. This is long, the, the big peak of that was in the 80s. This was well before. This was in the mid-70s. So he was doing a fashionable killing horses for insurance money and splitting it with the owner long before it became popular. 
The other thing he did is that he would, he had a puke standard bred stallion standing at his um, farm, and if he had a really top-notch race stallion in for surgery, he breed his mares to the race style. You know how all the race horse, whether it's standard bread or thoroughbred, think of that genetic line as solid gold, and you do not F with that that li that lineage and that GNA, DNA. Um, so anyway, he was illegally breeding his mares to these top-notch stallions and wow. fudging the papers. Lovely guy, lovely guy. At any rate, so he was my negative inspiration to go to vet school, so I'd never have to work for someone like that again. <laughs> Um, if you think of some of the past leaders, and I, I know we have a couple of veterinarians in the audience if they're still here, so if any of you have thoughts in the question and answer period, either in agreement or in um, dispute, I'm, I'm certainly op open to your, your comments. Um, past leaders include someone named Doug Corey from Walla Walla, Washington, and Tom Lenz. I know we have Lynn Cross in the audience. Didn't you have to go up against uh, Tom Lenz when you testified in Washington? Was that the most fun you'd ever had or what? Yep, that was what he was into. He's the creator of the Unwanted Horse Coalition. Unwanted by whom? By whose definition, you know? <laughs> and Corey, Corey, see, the tape can't see this. I, yeah, oh, yes, I can, doesn't it? Oh, man. I was thinking, I was thinking audio, how old-fashioned of me. Anyway, meanwhile, Doug Corey, I first met Doug Corey. Oh, God, don't keep mentioning the names. Um, he was past president of AAP, and he is, as you're right, on the Horse Council now. He's a rodeo kind of guy, so here he is on the Animal Welfare Committee of the AVMA supporting rodeos. Now, rodeos aren't all bad in that I will say that um, when I was a young teen, I did barrel racing with Little Colonel, this kick-ass pony. He loved it. He, it was something he hated about barrel racing is he had to wait his turn. <laughs> Everything else he loved. And I knew enough just to stay out of his way and let him just take over and run us through the barrel pattern. And we always won. It was a great experience. And that was humane because he loved it. He loved it more than I loved it. And he never got injured because he was cared, cared well for. Um, but, you know, everything else we've already heard about the horse tripping from Russ. You know, think about calf roping. Here you are, a little mammal, racing across the arena at 30 miles an hour, some big old honky coming behind you with his, you know, swinging lariat, ra you know, grabs you by the legs, knocks you to the ground, jerks you by your cervical vertebrae, dislocating sometimes and sometimes killing the animal that you've just jerked to the ground, and then jumping with your 250 pounds on top of it. And one quick sidebar about that. Um, when I used to do radio spots, whenever the circus would come to town in Albany, starting in 1991, when they got a big enough arena to have a circus or a rodeo, rodeo came too for a few years, and I would get on the um, radio stations in the morning saying, please boycott these shows. I'd explain briefly why they sucked and why they're inhumane, blah, blah, blah. And one thing that just came to me in the middle of a, of a quick spot on the radio was, you know, with calf roping, if you could take that six-month calf out of the arena and replace it with a six-month-old golden retriever puppy, everyone in the stands would recognize that that is cruel and they would stand up and be in horror that you did such a thing. So anyway... I go to work after I do that little call into the, TV, the uh, radio station, and this guy comes in who's an old farmer with an old hound. He thinks I'm a total crock of shit because I'm so you know, right of, left of center to him, but his hound dog loves me, so therefore he loves me. So he brings in his hound dog for me to do his rabies vaccine. He says, you know, Doc, you know, I think you're kind of out of there. You know, I think, you know, think I'm kind of like, you're, you're, I think you're kind of weird, but you know, I heard that thing you did on WGNA this morning, and you know... The more I thought about it, the more I got really steamed, you know? I thought about it. Supposing it was a six-month-old dog. Well, that's a pile of crap, and I'd already bought four tickets because I'm taking my son and the daughter-in-law and the grandchild, and I called up the radio people, and I canceled those tickets, and I told them to go to hell. <laughs> Yeehaw! <laughs> so the reason I bring that up, ladies and gentlemen, is you never know what phrase you might utter that drops that little pebble in the water that spreads out all those little wrinkles that, you know, make it far farther than you might think. Um, but at any rate, so um, the, the two names that I've mentioned about the AAP who are the leadership um, indicate sort of where their welfare stance is or is not. And there is a lot of Westerner-type people. And there is, after all, we I think all recognize a difference between being a Northeastern, you know, New England, New York State, New Jersey horse owner versus the Dakotas, Nebraska, whatever. Um, so, and again, the, the whole unwanted horse myth, which Tom Lenz crafted so carefully to be able to um, uh, do as he felt was fit and humane in terms of slaughter. And, you know, one thing that always has offended me a bit about the line they use when they try to talk about the unwanted horse issue, they say, you know, think about all these unwanted horses. They're elderly, they're decrepit, they're falling apart, and they're starving to death. What could be crueler than that? 
Well, that is kind of cruel, except we all know that the horses that end up in slaughter are not old, right? We've talked about that. I know, John, you've given statistics up the yin-yang. They're two to three to four to five to six. They could have a perfectly good life ahead of them if there was just a place for them and a, and a, and a, a pipeline for them to go that's alternative. And the other thing is, in, uh, you know, I do not ever want to be quoted as saying starvation is humane, but just think about the big picture. Starvation is terribly cruel, and it's long and it's chronic, but you're not being loaded onto a truck, which is terrifying. You're not having your teeth kicked down your throat, which is terrifying. You're not falling underneath the hooves of other horses and being trampled to death. And then you're not going through the whole experience of the slaughter plant and the smells and the sc screaming horses and everything else. So I'm not saying starvation is cruel, but I think that... Um, whether slaughter or starvation is crueler, one is just a lot quicker. But I'm not so sure it's, uh, well, obviously, that it's humane. Now, one interesting thing, in the last few years, I'm told by Animal Welfare Institute, who lobby heavily in the federal level, um, the AVMA and the AAEP are both becoming a little bit more silent about how lovely and humane slaughter is, because it's just too much known. And American public is becoming too educated. And so they're not going to say that it's inhumane. They're not going to stop supporting it. But they also are not claiming that it's a uh, such a very positive thing. And you'll notice the AAEP has a whole host of brochures for their clients on everything, you know, deworming programs and how to, you know, treat a, a pregnant mare and this, that, the other. And you never saw in their euthanasia flyers for their clients that slaughter was a lovely, humane, recommended euthanasia. They never said, don't worry, when your horse is old, just go ahead and take him off to a, a, a you know, a killer sale and have it get loaded on a truck. So they can talk one thing about what they supported in slaughter, but you sure didn't see it in print with the way they interacted with their clients. Um, and, of course, in the beginning, I think um, someone yesterday, I don't remember, maybe it was you, uh, had mentioned that um, the, in this case, again, Dr. Corey and Dr. Lenz actually went on a tour of a Mexican slaughter plant. I don't remember which one of you mentioned that. But at any rate, and so I've... Uh, oh, I'm so glad you mentioned it. Let me, uh, let me get that little quote. Now, I'm only slightly bitter here because I was dragged on a um, very choreographed artificial tour of a foie gras facility to shut me up by the New York State Vet Society. But I step ahead a little bit. So, Doug Corey, Tom Lenz, off to Mexico, taking a look at how the, uh, to get a better idea of how the Mexican horse slaughter industry operates, a delegation representing the AAEP arranged a tour with two Mexican slaughter facilities, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, just give me an effing break here. Everyone's dressed up in all nice white, shiny, you know, clothes. Okay. The AAEP group met with the manager of the plant, was allowed free access throughout the building where they spent three to four hours. They allowed us to look at everything and take pictures. Even in the United States, you're seldom allowed to take pictures at a processing plant, Dr. Lenz said. said. Uh, Dr. Lenz, who's also chairman of the Unwanted Horse Coalition, looked at the horses in the paddocks where most stay for a week or so. He said the pens were clean. Okay, we know it's already fabricated. And the horses looked good. Ditto. Although he classified them as slimmer. Uh, <laughs> workers move the horses with flags rather than whips. Well, I'm sure they don't use whips when no one's around. Uh, and then they talk about the fact that they did have a mechanical restraint device to hold the head. Excuse me, not hold, but to cradle the head. Uh, the shooters were extremely accurate in quotes. Carcasses randomly tested for drug residues. Employees, this is my favorite part, employees wear white coveralls, hats, gloves, masks, and hair nets while working. Oh, please. And scrub their boots before coming in and out of the processing area. All in all, the plant was an extremely clean, well-run plant. From a veterinary perspective, the animals were handled well. Well, that is wonderful. So that means that if you arrange this two and a half months in advance and everyone's all ready, <laughs> they're going to do that for you. And the, again, the only reason I'm slightly bitter, oh, please do, be my guest. Um, the only reason I'm slightly bitter is I mentioned foie gras, which I fought futilely for many years. And part of what probably was up against me is that the largest foie gras producer is in the Catskills here in New York State. It's called Hudson Valley Foie Gras. It used to be called Commonwealth Foie Gras. I was involved with PETA in 1991 with an undercover investigation of, Hudson, of the Commonwealth Foie Gras facility. It, the uh, evidence was so damning and so horrific that the Sullivan County AD, ADA said, we can't lose this case. This is going to be great. We're going to nail these buggers. We're going to put them out of business. But then he got a call from 
Cornell Cooperative Extension and the Farm Bureau and the then head of the New York State Society, whose name I won't mention, uh, who closeted him for two hours and basically uh, verbally roughed him up. The DA came out two hours later, read in the face and furious and said, don't ever talk to me about it again, and stomped out of the room. So clearly he had been threatened that if he ever tried to bring that lawsuit against this company, it would be the end of his career. So anyway, I then was um, invited to go back to tour this facility by Whole Foods Incorporated uh, because uh, F Hudson Valley Foie Gras, this is when they were still really stupid, thought that if they could just show Whole Foods how humane the practice was, then Whole Foods would carry their product nationwide and wouldn't that boost sales, blah, blah, blah. But they didn't realize how it looks to the uninitiated who do this kind of brutality three times a day, 365 days a year. So. First of all, they told the Whole Foods representatives, you know, the ducks love the process. They come running to be force-fed. <laughs> and they gave them this whole line of, of bullshit. And um, I was asked to go along because they had heard my name associated with the first investigation. And they said, we don't know anything about ducks and management. Would you tell us what we're looking at? So the tour that they let us look at in 1995 was actually showing the real, the real system, which was so horrific that the poor Whole Foods people who did not know what they were coming into came out. One of them said she puked in the car on the way home. Um, they came out and they said, we were lied to. Of course, we'll never cover any, do anything with this business. This was horrific. I've never seen anything so brutal. And they were just shocked. But the point of that story is that Hudson Valley Fuagra went, oops, marketing error here. I guess we can't let anyone see what really goes on. So fast forward to 2004. Foie gras is made illegal in California, God bless the West Coast. And um, we were trying to get the um, AVMA to take a stand against it, which of course they never would. And in 2004, Hudson Valley Foie gras realized that their whiting was on the wall for them. So they started creating these very choreographed, um, expurgated tours that they would provide everyone. So for the next year and a half, there were gourmet magazine chefs, there were veterinarians, there were USDA representatives, there were all kinds of people coming through to tour their practice, their plant. But, and I was invited by the New York State Vet Society's executive board just to shut me the hell up because I kept trying to show them videos. And um, what I saw was a very different scene. Instead of having like 20 people, clanging noise, rushing through these birds, jamming this pipe down their throat, noise, stink, seizuring birds. I mean, literally birds that are having epileptic seizures while they're force feeding them because, you know, you don't have to have them swallow. You're just going to be placing it down in their guts. Um, but instead of that, what I saw was two teeny tiny Latina women. They make me look like a horse. I tower above them. And there were about maybe 20 birds. And they were just kind of drifting in this very zen-like fashion through the plant and feeding the, go the, the ducks very gently and very quietly and silently. And I did the math. At that time, they were producing 6,000 birds a week at the rate at which this little uh, sanitized tour would be indicating they'd be producing 200, not 6,000, but 200 birds a week. So the math did not work out. But at any rate, what I'm saying that for is that I'm a, an old hand at seeing when you have a guided tour that is a real thing or what's total bullshit with everyone in their, in their shiny white clothes. Um, let's see what else we want to say here. Oh, yes, Nina Weinand, the woman I mentioned earlier, mentioned that the AAP, AAEP is also less supportive of Tom Lenz than they used to be in the past, because I think they're realizing they need to kind of cut their losses and get some distance there. So um, basically, the financial underpinnings of their um, pro-slaughter position, think about what a horse veterinarian may be involved with. For one thing, if you're in a practice that has a lot of breeding, you're not going to stifle breeding because that's how you're getting your income. You know, you're doing the rectals to find out when she's going to be in heat. You're doing the blood test to find out this, that, the other. You're doing the rectals to find out how f far along she is. So a lot of veterinarians whose life depends on horses, i.e. AAEP members, are certainly not going to limit breeding. That's where their bread and butter is coming from. Um, you know, the more horses, the more surgeries, the more treatments, the more blood work. And particularly with the quarter horse industry, um, quarter horses, I believe, allow um, artificial insemination, not just live cover the way thoroughbreds do. And therefore, they're very uh, persnickety about their bloodlines, and there's a lot of genetic testing that goes on. I've never done this branch of medicine, so I myself am not experienced. But again, if there's any horse vets who want to comment, certainly feel free to do so. But my point being is that there's a financial incentive for equine veterinarians and AAEP members to not necessarily limit breeding. Um, and uh, Dr. Nick Dodman, who we mentioned earlier, is the one who founded the Veterinarians for Equine Welfare. 
Um, he told me in a conversation that an AAEP state representative who opposed horse slaughter was told that she could not hold that position if she revealed to the public or to anyone else that she was anti-slaughter. So the AAEP put pressure on her to, to you know, shut the F up. Uh, similarly, another one, uh, an anti-slaughter AAEP member, uh, was forced to back down when her practice's success began to be undermined by AAP competitors who um, spread sort of tales about her. So she was pressured to not voice her opinion. And furthermore, the AAP uh, attacked Tufts because Nick Dodman wrote an anti-slaughter op-ed, I believe, and he happened to put it on Tufts Veterinary School stationery. The AAP got a hold of it, came landing down upon Tufts, who then landed upon Dr. Nick Dodman and basically threatened him and better you know, retract that statement. So Nick did, in fact, express the fact that it was, uh, did not reflect his views, did not reflect that of Tufts. But the AAP is certainly very um, quick to circle the wagons and punish anyone who um, steps out of line in their opinion. And since I mentioned Tufts, um, that sort of segues nicely into veterinary school positions. And I only contacted three, which are here in the Northeast, Tufts, Cornell, and Penn. Their official position is to have no position. I think they just can't. You know, they're very involved with the racing industry, with the, with the breeding, with the sports medicine type stuff. They just cannot dare take a stand that's going to lose them clients or lose them funding and all of that. So they just say, make up your own mind. We won't pass judgment. Now, I don't know about Texas A&M, and I don't know about UC Davis, which are much more production-oriented schools. And it would be interesting to know what their thoughts were. Um, Two final vet groups I just want to quickly mention, though. There's the Veterinarians for Equine Welfare, which I mentioned earlier, formed, founded by Nick Dodman specifically to show, particularly Congress, on a federal and a state level, that the, not all horse vets thought that slaughter was a good thing. So that is what their website is all about. And for those of you who want to really get very dreary and depressed sometime, they've got several Canadian videos of horses being shot multiple times, screaming each time. and. Um, it is obviously not a humane way for them to go down, but they certainly deserve support, the Veterinarians for Equine Welfare. There's also the Humane Society Veterinary Medical Association, which was found, oh, uh, VEW was founded in 2007 specifically to counteract the AAEP stance that all equine veterinary medicine supports slaughter. HSVMA was founded in 2008. It was a merger between the Humane Society and Association of Veterinarians for Animal Rights, and I was a founding member of both AVAR and of uh, HSVMA. Um, uh, one quick other sidebar, AVAR, when we founded that in 1981, we did not realize that we thought, okay, we'll just say right, we'll just go right out that we're veterinarians for animal rights so that people realize that highly educated professionals may still feel that animal rights is a logical philosophy. In 81, remember, in the media, animal rights is still put in quotes like animal rights. Um, <laughs> So at any rate, um, come the second term of GW's presidency, and he decides that all the greatest domestic terror threat were animal rights activists. Yeah. I will share with you that I'm not the greatest domestic terror threat. Yeah. So please, <laughs> please let that be known. But at any rate, we could no longer get into veterinary schools with that title. So uh, there were various pluses and minuses to merge with the HSV, with the HSUS. But overall, it's been a very good uh, reliance. And I want to read you our policy statement on slaughter because. We are right out there about how it sucks. Um, so our policy is horse slaughter and unwanted horses. HSVMA is opposed to the commercial slaughter of horses and other equids. Each year, tens of thousands of American horses, including riding horses, children's ponies, carriage horses, and race horses, among others, are inhumanely transported to be slaughtered by, for overseas consumption. The majority are young, healthy animals who could have gone on to lead productive lives. Horse slaughter is not humane euthanasia. Horses are generally transported long distances in crowded travelers, traveling for many hours or even days on end without rest, food, or water. They often arrive exhausted, dehydrated, severely injured, or even dead, the result of fights or falls sustained during their journeys. They panic in the kill box, making them difficult to stun accurately, and are sometimes conscious while they're being suspended by a back leg, bled out and dismembered. HSVMA promotes a commitment to, f to a lifetime care and responsible breeding practices as an essential principle of equine stewardship. In the unfortunate cases in which people are unable to continue to care for their horse, HSVMA promotes humane options including careful rehoming, relinquishment to a sanctuary or a rescue facility, or when necessary, humane euthanasia by a trained professional. Yes. 
so at any rate, um, another thing that Humane Society VMA, VMA has is a uh, the rural area veterinary uh, specialty rural rural area veterinary services program RAVS, and you can always check it out on our website. It's a very exciting opportunity for young veterinarians to go into Native American reservations and also to uh, Central and South America to do uh, work which includes not only spaying and neutering dogs and cats but also treating horses. And it really gets, what I like about it is it gets the next generation, the next generation of ass kickers as I like to call them, um, really trained to think in terms of humane ethic and not making a lot of money but doing the right thing. And it's um, any student that goes on those programs comes out totally inspired. So finally, um, how about the American Farrier Association? I contacted them, and like the vet schools, their official position is that they have no official position. And I think it's because they get close to their breeders, their owners, their whatevers, their clients, and it's just too divisive. But what's interesting is that when I talk to my own farrier, who does work with not only um, saddlebreds and the five-gated animals, ah, um, as well as racehorses, as well as backyard horses, he's convinced, and he told me, I'm sure the American Farrier Association is opposed to slaughter. When I called them up, they weren't. But I think it's interesting that he's so convinced that they are, and I think that means that in his own circle of friends here in this part of New England and New York, his set of friends are very opposed. And I think if you, for those of you who have horses, pick your farrier's yeah. brain just for the hell of it, just for shits and giggles, and find out how they feel and how they handle it. Um, Breeders, um, you know, as I think John, you were pointing out that mercifully the numbers are now finally smaller in terms of numbers of quarter horses churned out every year and thoroughbreds churned out every year. Uh, but there's certainly a disincentive to limit the breeding because, um, you know, you register your quarter horse fold with the American Quarter Horse Association and there's money that goes to that association. Um, for the veterinarians who are doing uh, the testing, the genetic testing or the whatever kind of testing they're doing as well as medical care, well, you know, the more clients the better. Um, and there are various kickbacks with the laboratories um, to the breeders and to the veterinarians for doing certain genetic testing uh, on these animals. So, um, by the way, the fact that the new foal gets registered with the AQHA, -A -A, let's see, AQHA, -A -A, thank you there, um, is very much like the AKC in puppy mills. You know, who would logically be the people to shut down puppy mills? Well, here's an idea. How about the people that are all about breeding dogs in a healthy and, ha and happy manner? But in fact, every puppy mill litter that gets registered with the AKC is a lot more money, and that's a huge source of the AKC's income. So you're not about to see them shut that down soon, and that's for sure. But anyway, enough of the problem. How about the solution? Um, one, this will be very quick because I think we're, oops, I, may, I guess I've even run a little long, perhaps. Uh, anyway, um, Way one, it'd be nice if veterinarians would become more ethical and less production oriented and in fact start to advise breeders to decrease production more. And I know that there are a lot of veterinarians out there who do that, so I should not be so embittered by the AAEP that I do not fail to mention that there are some wonderful leading lights in that field who do just that and say, are you sure about that foal? You already got more than you can maybe take care of. You really should rethink this a bit. I would love it if vet schools would teach more responsibility. Uh, you know, there's some there's this vet school out west in um, Southern California called Western University, which is a very left of center, humane oriented, wonderful vet school, and they certainly teach that kind of thing with first year students. Is to you know think about what you are advising your clients and how does that reflect on the animal's future humane care or not. And then you have Texas A&M, which is a different concept altogether. Um, three, how about gelding clinics? Um, Susan was nice enough to help me out by getting a couple of things that she had come across on the internet. Um, gelding clinics can be done by vet schools, and in fact, the United, uh, the Unwanted Horse Coalition has got a gelding clinic this month with Tufts. Now, that's a fantastic experience for students because they're going to be doing large volumes. Students could finally get their hands on that procedure before they're doing it the first time all by themselves in the field the way I did. And of course, you know, my first one luckily went very smoothly, but the person noticed that I looked kind of young and said, so how many of you done of these? And I said, God, you know, I, I can't even count by now. And was, <laughs> Thank goodness it went well. I was a cocktail waitress. I was a good bullshit artist. Um, and then uh, you, know, you also could have major equine practices. I'm thinking here in Kentucky. How about Hagar Davis and, and McGee cough up a few, you know, dollars and some expertise and do some gelding clinics down there? And there's all kinds of ways to make money that you see in the small animal practices that work with rescue groups. Put a cash box on your counter where your clients check out and pay their bill. 
you know, donate for future Gelding clinics or whatever. Um, and you can get um, clients to be involved in funding these things as well by making them feel that they're part of the solution, not part of the problem. Uh, oh, by the way, for the um, Tufts Clinic, I just want to read you. This is the United um, Unwanted Horse Coalition's uh, arrangement with Tufts to do this Gelding Clinic, which is going to be on... Uh, don't remember exactly what it is, but sometime in May. So the people that um, collaborative donations came from the American Association of Equine Practitioners, the AVMA, Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association, the American Quarter Horse Association, and Masters of Foxhounds Association. Mm -hmm. As my stepmother would once have said, that's quite the rogues gallery now, isn't it? <laughs> so this is how they make themselves feel better. By the way, all of you who don't know the Oscar Wilde quote about fox hunting should know it. Fox hunting is the unspeakable in pursuit of the inedible. <laughs> At any rate, the other thing is um, euthanasia clinics, and this is a little bit sadder, but certainly very needed. There used to be a group called NorCal Equine Rescue, and some of you may have heard of that group. They started doing euthanasia clinics in the about 2007, 2008. They have since changed their name to Help Horse Plus Humane Society, and they've created a Last Act of Kindness Foundation for donations for these, these programs. They're doing them in three states, California, Oklahoma, and the newest program is in Tennessee. Um, they use either veterinarians or certified euthanasia technicians, and these are people who may be vet techs or not, but they've been trained specifically by a state-mandated course on how to do proper euthanasias humanely. And the horses are going to be first given an injection of rompin or xylazine to tranquilize them mildly, and then they're euthanized with fatal plus. In California, they will charge 125 for euthanasia and disposal through rendering, but they'll also do it for free if you can't come up with the money, because the important thing is to give that horse a dignified exit off the planet. Uh, Oklahoma, the bodies are sent to a landfill for a $45 charge, and the new program in Tennessee, I don't know the cost, but the bodies also are sent to a landfill as solid waste and are, waste and are covered. So I think, um, you know, if I were in an equine practice, that would be something I would be very interested in, in, in doing, is trying to make a um, gentle and kind way for these horses to, to leave the planet and not have the youth slaughter as what they think is their only option. I'm always a little skeptical about people who think they can't pay it, though, because you know what? As soon as you euthanize that horse, that's several hundred dollars a month and thousands a year that you're not paying anymore. So I'll bet you could come up with the money. But anyway, no quibbling. If you can do a euthanasia clinic, better than not euthanizing. And I think we as veterinarians need to educate, uh, and not only veterinarians but advocates, educate people about thoroughbred overbreeding. You need to have zillions of animals to choose from to have the few successful competitors, but that's not good for the ones that don't make it to the track. And also donate. I know there's at least four rescue groups in this room that I have seen the cards on and the labels, and I know personally three of them. Um, that's where people should be encouraging their friends and fellows to, to donate money. To these are, these are the people that are bad in cleanup for the irresponsible horse owners. And you know, for those of you uh, who uh, have your own horses and veterinarians, talk with your veterinarian about what their feeling is and what they're doing to try to make a, a, a humane end to this problem. But you know, um, my my oh, um, you had asked me, or maybe it was Karen who asked me. Just for those of you who don't know, slight sidebar: this is about Premarin. You may have heard me yesterday answering Susan's question or someone's question about Premarin being used by veterinarians for incontinent female dogs. Uh, if they can't come up with diacylstilbestrol, which is very easy to have formulated in formulary pharmacies, some vets are now using Premarin. So if you have an incontinent female dog and your vet talks about treating it with Premarin, say, I don't think so. Anyway, my main advice to all of you is my only strategy is I'm trying to outlive these bastards. So <laughs> I want you to do the same, so please look both ways when you cross the street. <laughs> <laughs>